Okay, we're gonna hold up. So, live. Hi, we're live. We're back. Um, we're just waiting uh, for people to come on live. Uh, okay, I, yeah, we got, we got. Okay, so people are coming on live. This is great. Uh, Liz Tims has joined. Um, Do this. Got some people coming online. Anyway, we want to start. This is the episode three of um, Africa's Country Live. We've had two episodes already. It's the third one. Uh, my name is Sean Jacobs. This is Zachary Rosen. Zachary Rosen. We, for now, we are the presenters of this <laughs> show. We're not saying we're the permanent presenters. We just have to get things going. Um, presenters might change, but for now, it's us. Today's episode, actually, we want to, we, normally what we try to do is we try to cover at least like three or four things, but I think for today we'll, we'll dedicate the whole show, if you want, just to talk about the life, the legacy, the politics of, of the writer, um, thinker, intellectual, or Nena, or Nena, as they, we were listening to Kenyan TV, so we could get it right. Mm-hmm. Because some of us say Wainana, but it's actually Binyavanga, Wainena. And so we want to talk about his life. We've got a couple of topics. We're going to, we're going to cover a lot of ground in the time um, that we hear. But maybe we should... Why don't we start off, Zach, by just saying, like, when we first... Um, before we talk about, like, his significance and, like, why people should care about Binyavanga and, like, you know, everything that he represented, I think it might be cool just to say, like, where we first encountered his work. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I, I encountered his work through interacting with the, with the Chimaringa family uh, and seeing the innovative media that they were creating and he was part of their, their, larger, their larger circle and so like many people I, I first encountered the essay How to Write About Africa but, but didn't stop there and, and moved on to seeing the Kwani Journal that was already in existence that he was part of founding uh, and then was excited to see him at different uh, literary festivals in in South Africa and in New York, and encountering the way he spoke with his with his hands his style. And, and, <laughs> and his whole head, and would tell incredibly winding, meandering stories, but they always eventually got somewhere. Right. Um, so that's that was that's, my, that's my entry thing. point. Mine is like way older. Um, I say. I mean, this is this is actually the part that I that I like about the Binyavanga story is like I sort of encountered Binyavanga when I don't think he was he wasn't even that well known and this is before Chimaranga even I mean I was involved at the beginnings of Chimaranga but in the late nineties and I was trying to figure out was the late nineties with the early two thousand but I know it was roughly like the late nineties I was working at a public policy institute in South Africa in Cape Town called the Institute for Democracy it was like a political researcher there. And um, the newspaper market in South Africa is, you know, it's like some, there's some good and there's some bad. I remember like the, the so-called alternative, the old alternative press, the, the remnants of it, like the Mail and Guardian at that point was like still the decent newspaper with really good op-eds, really good like art section. But most of the newspapers were kind of crappy, no disrespect to my colleagues in South Africa at the time. But um, the, this newspaper called The Weekend August, so there's this company called IOL, well, now it's called Iowa, then it was called Independent News Service. They published the August in the morning, and the, the Cape Town's in the morning, and the August at night in, in the city of Cape Town. I was working there. And in the weekend August, which was this really, it was a terrible newspaper. Apologies to my friends. But it was a terrible newspaper. It was basically like they had a week to write a story, but <laughs> they would literally write, the front page is just like, I don't know, accident on the highway. That's the front page. After you had a week to investigate something. But anyway, the thing about Binyavanga was they had a section called like kind of like the weekender or something, mm-hmm. which is the TV listings, maybe some kind of like social, you know, social gathering where people are like like at the race course or you know, a party, you know, like the parties around the socialites, oh, yeah. were kind of terrible. But anyway, and they uh, maybe some travel piece, but like buried somewhere like right before the TV section was a little column also about wine a lot, which is also bizarre in a city in which. <laughs> A lot of people couldn't like uh, afford this wine or this kind of traveling, but well, Cape Town is kind of a mind blower. Um, anyway, so Binyavanga had this column about food in there, and I didn't, I had no clue who this guy was. I was just like, I was just struck by how somebody with a distinctly non South African name, 
and you know, you sort of like, oh, he's Kenyan, um, and who, who looked like he was like a, he, he was like a character with like, you know, wearing sort of like kaftan type clothing, loose clothing, dreads, big guy, and he was writing about food, but like in a way, I saw an essay the other day where he wrote about, in Discovering Home, where he writes about eating some Kenyan special bean at somebody's house in Santon. Mm. But that's the kind of stuff he was writing in yeah. his Weekend August column. And it was just incredible writing, like seeing that kind of, see, because at that time, no one was writing about food in that way. Maybe not, maybe here, but not in places like South Africa. Or if they were writing, they were writing about food that like, that like white people are eating in the northern suburbs or something. And Yervin Yavanga was doing it in a forum. Trying to imitate yeah. what I had been like a European publication. As right, well. and like to see <laughs> someone write about with, with the references, the style, everything was just brilliant. And then, you know, I happened to, when Chimarenga started, I sort of got involved there. Um, and then, you know, you start seeing Pinya Vanga's pieces and uh, I finally met him eventually. I, in fact, I actually met him I've met him a bunch of times with one meeting was actually, um, I can give away where I live, but <laughs> close to where I live at a, at, a, at a restaurant which was then called Liquors. It was like a bar. And then Tone Jabe, Bongechi Mutu came, um, and Binavanga was there. And, and I, I, I had a little kid, and I was just like, oh, I'll come by and say hi. <laughs> but that's one of those meetings. I have many others with him. But just an incredibly generous, garrulous, you know, larger than life personality yeah and, and yeah. he's not the kind of person that if, if you go to the event at the end he he goes home afterwards he wants nah, to have a drink sticks around yeah he wants he to have around, a drink yeah. and hang out yeah. and tell stories yeah. and i will mention one other one before we talk about kind of his most important legacy he what people might assume, you know when people think about me what do they talk about but one other one is um before the 2010 world cup um, I had just joined the new school, I, I had a little, my daughter was like, my oldest kid was then maybe like one years old or something, mm -hmm. um, or two or three, I can't even remember, she was very young actually, no, actually she was old, but, but she was a little kid and, and I started, I just sort of come out of that thing of like, okay, I can start doing stuff again, so one of the things, in, and I think it was the first ever event I planned at the new school, was called Africa's World Cup, this is right before the 2010 World Cup in South Africa. And I managed to get Teju Cole, Boston Merrill, who eventually founded a thing called Everyday Africa. Mm -hmm. And I also, I also, um, uh, Austin Merrill, Tony Karen, and Binyavago Nana. We made up a panel that led eventually to a class that Tony and I taught about football. But once again, just like, if you go look at the video, he's just in fine form, um, you know, just like a great performer. Like a, and, and sharing ideas with an incredible human being. Yeah. <laughs> So why don't we, should we talk about, why don't we talk firstly about why is it that people, what, what are the things that the people remember? Sure, before? yeah, yeah. Um, I think it would be interesting <laughs> to think about the, the major moments of his life that are, that are often remembered as the, the most significant for being in the, in the public right. eye. Uh, and then add a lot more depth in, and complicate right. those moments because right. we're not giving you the New York Times obituary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for most <laughs> people, the truth is, for most people, when they say Binyavanga, they're thinking, uh, how to write about Africa. That's, that's the first thing. Yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind. And I'm perhaps really, sometimes the only thing for right. some people. Yeah, yeah, that's the only, probably the only piece that they've ever encountered. Um, if they have, and, and you know, it was a great piece. I mean, we, we can't underestimate the impact of that piece of writing, this is like 20... Early 2000s. Early 2000s or something? Early to mid 2000s. Um, we, 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 gotta, we gotta look for the exact date, but it comes out sort of roughly also around the time that I think I was still blogging as Leo Africanus on the <laughs> on blog. Yeah. And, and trying to kind of enter this debate around, not to make this about me, <laughs> but like I was, I was trying to like, you know, talk back, talk back to like these kind of very decontextualized like ways that people talk about Africa and he injected that essay it's, it's like what we were doing was like small fry a few people pay pay attention experts mm -hmm. maybe people who really care about Africa mm -hmm. and this guy just came like a storm and he like you know and like that thing with the, the kids they say they dropped the mic like he literally did that <laughs> no, he totally he totally when he wrote that it was an incredible I think it was an incredible uh, piece of writing and we, we don't want to you know go back and read like every part of it 
but there's just some great lines in there. If you go back, I would recommend it. Um, but as we were as we were saying, we, when we were sort of like prepping for this thing, we did we did sort of like I, I, I don't know if you said I pulled out it, but um, I printed this out. But we did note that like that essay. What's interesting about that essay is that most people will get stuck on the on like that particular only on how to prep for Africa. The thing is, he later on. You wrote another essay, right? Yes. Yeah. You want <laughs> I mean, to say the, something about it? Yeah. The first yeah. essay comes at a, at a particular moment where there's a lot of kind of live aid style media. Of, right. Right. Of yeah. We move around a lot. Savior, you know, mentality stuff, and so that that piece comes out. But all, but then also time passes, and and everybody is saying to him, you know, okay, how you know how okay, do I invite him to conferences? <laughs> like he literally, I mean. No disrespect, but he built, he managed, he's an incredibly, I mean, we'll talk a little bit later, we're going to talk about just his incredible, is the word oeuvre? Oh God, I missed that one. No, your oeuvre, like your your body of work, like he wrote, he he wrote an enormous amount of like, like he wrote a lot. Opinion pieces. Opinion pieces, pieces of creative writing, short essays that people have that, you know, there's a website that, that was started, I think, jointly by Chimarenga Kwani, um, with the help of Asal Prabhala, who at the times was Binaranga's editor, um, where you can just see the length, like, it's called Planet Binya, like the first part of his name, that, that order.com, and you can actually see, like, this, the breadth of this guy's writing. Um, but people sort of got stuck on this, like, once he had written How to Write About Africa, which is the way that the, way that the public sphere works, Everybody got just that's where it ended, and he's jokingly talks about how he got in, he gets invited to the World Economic Forum uh, to become what a young global influencer or something. something. Yeah. Um, that's that became his calling card. Like suddenly everybody wanted him. He had written a short story. I'm not sure if it was before that or after that. He wrote. He won the Kane Prize for for that was before that was before that. But discovering mm-hmm. home like nobody, which is which is a longer debate. We could have another time about. <laughs> Like for the the uh, you know what is it that people value? Is it that kind of like literary academic writing, or is it this more kind of popular writing um, that you do? And he, but anyway, this essay got big, right? It it, it became big. That became when you said Vinaya Banga went out, somebody would be like, yeah, I don't know about Africa. Exactly, and right. it also became a way for liberal institutions right. that wanted to signal that they were thinking and trying to be progressive. They would invite him yeah. and ask him, "Okay, how do we do it right, please?" Well, I love this. I <laughs> this is the best part of this. I mean, so so the essay we actually want to talk about is that that, that nobody often talks about is this one called "How to Write About Africa Two: The Revenge." And Ambadun, you couldn't really date it, but I think it's like twenty fourteen, maybe or something like that. Yeah, and some years later, it's Badun is this publication, um, sort of like Arab. Uh, Iranian. It's a Middle Eastern. Yeah, the new Middle East kind of cultural yeah. publication. And they 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 publish some interesting things. Michael Vasquez, who started um, or was involved in the beginnings of transition, um, with people like uh, I think Kenneth Fasane was there with him, and he was also involved before that with the website Africana.com, which is like by the way, you like what is he talking yeah. about? <laughs> That's like the originals when before there was no Africa as a country. This if you talk hip hop, okay, this is like the ice. This is like iced tea, <laughs> kind of after Cass, whatever. So anyway, um, he, uh, Michael Vasquez was the editor of this publication and they asked him to write this thing, how to write about Africa too. And I, I, we shared this on our Facebook page. You can go find the essay, the link to the essay on our Facebook page. But what, you'll, what I've noticed, like very few people have ever read this. It's the most like self, would you say deprecating? Yeah, I think so. It's it's He's a taking the piss of yourself, basically. <laughs> He's just like, how is it that that thing I wrote in in a, as an email originally to complain about an issue of Granta, and then they asked me to write something in response to their well, I've got to backtrack. Granta did an Africa issue. Binyavanga complained to the editor about this Africa issue by writing them an email, mm-hmm. which is which was a rant. He, they then say to him, why don't you help us come up with a new Africa issue? He suggests people to write. They say, no, why don't you write something? Yeah. He writes this, he, he tries to write something on Paul Keldor. <laughs> yeah, Paul Keldor. 
I was adding demo, <laughs> it doesn't work, right? It, it was like, a crap piece, so he, he says that he didn't like it. Right, 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 like yeah, it. yeah. And then they finally just said, you know, how about the email? That you wrote to <laughs> us. And then he said it took him like an one, hour, one hour to write this thing back. It. And he's like, this accidental email that I wrote as a rant becomes this larger essay. And so in this thing, I mean, you could, we could both, if we want to read some lines from it, but I like the opening of this thing where he says novelist. So this is like, he's now reflecting back on how to write about Africa. And he says novelist, NGO workers, rock musicians, conservationists, students, and travel writers tracked down my email asking, would you please comment on my homework assignment, pamphlet, short <laughs> story, funding proposal, haiku, adopt a child, photograph of genuine African mother-in-law? All of the people who do this are white. Nobody from China asked, nobody from Cuba, nobody black, blackish, brown, beige, coffee, cappuccino, mulatto. I wrote How to Write About Africa as a piss job, a venting of steam. It was never supposed to see the light of day. Now people write to ask me for permission to write about Africa. They want me to tell them what I think, how they be, be frank, they say, be candid, tell it like it is. And then he just, he just goes on about how they, they are disappointed when he doesn't like want to tell them. Sometimes he says, I do, but sometimes I'm just like, why am I doing this? And then he gets confronted by people who are offended by it. Like, why are you <laughs> saying this about me? Um, but yeah, it's just a great little, it's a great rant about like how something, oh, and it becomes, then people started forwarding it to him. And say, hey, check yeah, here's something you should read. Yeah, <laughs> here's something you should read. It becomes viral, it becomes spam, um, <laughs> it becomes the guy, the conscience of Africa. Like in the end he says, I will admonish you and give you my uh, uh, absolution. <laughs> like it's hilarious that something that he wrote as just a kind of like a, as, you, as we said earlier, a rant becomes this bigger thing. Yeah. And I think it, you know, the, the style of this, of this revenge piece is also similar to other comments that are made about cultural politics these days, which is, you know, it's not my job to, to do this, you know, it, to, labor to like, save you or whatever, yeah, to do the uh, labor. The whole yeah. point is, yeah. you know, I'm not, it's not my, my job to give you permission to do everything. Just think critically, you know, consult people and produce work that's really actually meaningful. And also the other part of it, I think that was interesting was, it wasn't like radical to tell people like, this is what this is. Then, well, let me, let me rephrase that. It, it wasn't like, he's just saying like, don't write stereotypes. And you wouldn't it's think also it needed to be, but yeah, it kind of did. And, he, and, he, and it he's did also writing sad. that on the back of like, a ton of other people have been doing this as academic work, like the systematic work, like there's a great book called Reading National Geographic. Yeah. Um, which I know courses of photography mm -hmm. and film will always prescribe. There's Catherine Mathis, actually, um, we'll mention this later, who made a film called um, When I Say Africa. Catherine Mathis produced this film along with uh, Cassandra Herman, which Binyaranga, by the way, is in. We posted about that on Instagram, on our Instagram account. Um, it, she wrote a book about this kind of travel, these people who travel to, to Africa, American students, American travelers, mm, American yeah. humanitarian workers. So there's a lot of, there's, there's, always, there's always been academic work about this kind of thing. You know, is that what he wasn't saying wasn't entirely new, but nobody had said it in the way he said it with the kind of, just like the, 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 the style. The voice. The I voice, mean, yeah. It was incredible. It, it was an writing. African, it was a black, a young black African who said it. Um, somebody coming from a middle class background right, who's saying, yeah. you know, there's a, it, it sounds silly now because yeah. it's so obvious, mm -hmm. but there's, there's more nuance, there's more complexity, uh, and it's ridiculous that we even have to talk right, about this, right. uh, and doing it in a funny, entertaining way. So right. that was what resonated. So um, we want to, we, because we, we've got other, other topics we want to cover, the other essay that he is known for. Well, it, after the, he, you know, he published his memoir, right. he, he tried to, right. to give his background um, and talk about his, his journey as a writer and as a thinker, um, and that came out, and there was, there was a certain amount of acclaim. He's, a, he's, he's got this incredibly unique voice. This is one day, one, one day, day I will write about, about this place. place. Yeah. Um, but for many people, and, and in his own mind, it seemed that there was, there was something missing from there. 
So um, in 2014, January, he, yeah. around his birthday, he published a piece called I Am Homosexual Mom, uh, which was considered the last chapter of the memoir. Uh, and he did it in a particular way. So what was that? <laughs> this guy my, hey, he did it. By the way, I noticed that guy ruined my hat. This is the Ray J moment. <laughs> if you're into the internet, you'll get what I'm talking about. Um, where Ray J, like, <laughs> this is like a meme where he, he's in a love and hip hop. You know the, the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the way they shot it, they would he would wear his hat, and then it's the same scene, but the next thing they had is like this, or like they had like he's having the same discussion, but in the next sentence they had his gear. Yeah, yeah. So people had like the whole the whole like produce. Yeah, yeah, but also they wanted to like investigate the story of the hat. But anyway, um, how did we get the essay? Let's get back to the series. Yeah, part. yeah. The essay we got um, basically he. He had approached Chimurenga, which is the magazine we mentioned at the outset, and Africa is a country, which is the thing, the magazine we work on. And he, through, actually through us, I mean, I may as well tell the story now, South Bravila sends me this email, I think it's like Saturday morning, and I remember my son plays soccer or whatever, I have a little <laughs> kid, at that time he's playing soccer, I've got to get him to soccer or whatever. I just pop up my computer like, yo, like we want to run, it's his birthday, um, and he wants this to be published today on his birthday. <laughs> but he wants to, so he's, I think his birthday was like the Sunday morning, but it was the Saturday afternoon in New York, like six o'clock in New York. And uh, I'm like, but what about this part? This part is not right, this part. They're like, no, nah, Binya Vanga has gone offline. We don't know where he is. Um, he's not gonna respond to any of this. He's enjoying his birthday. <laughs> yeah. And so, it was just a shocker to like try to figure this out. I, I, I kind of remember when it's like a little back and forth between me and Ashala, but hey, what about that part? What about this part? And eventually um, it got published. And I want to say a couple of other things about this is the next, the Monday, I think he reemerges and he puts a bunch of videos online. I think one of them was called, if I'm trying to find my notes here, um, I know people can hear this noise I'm making, but uh, <laughs> One, one of them was like, uh, I think it was a series of videos, We Are, what was it called again? Is it called We Are All Nigerians, is it? I forgot the title of the series. There's something, it's about the imagination. Yeah, we, it's, it's like six videos that he, that, he, um, that he brought out like the next week where he talks about homophobia in Nigeria. He talks about what it is like to, um, to come out. We are- We must free our free imagination. Free our imagination. Yeah, like six videos, you can go look, to, look at them on, on YouTube, um, but here's the thing that I think was really interesting about that moment, which is he was asked actually by, he was interviewed by NPR the next week, because if you go in the archive, you'll notice if you go on any website, a news website, you'll notice that they all talk about the fact that he published this essay on these two websites simultaneously. But what's interesting about it was he got interviewed by NPR and he gets asked, why is it that you decided you know, to, to come out in the way you did? And he said, well, and um, if I, and I'm just gonna paraphrase, and I reckon I wrote a short post about it on Africa's country at the time, but he literally said to NPR, um, if I had gone and I had published it in the New Yorker, then the reaction would have been, it could have been read, or, and the reaction could have been, yes, we never know, why, why not, why Nana, writing about being gay in darkest Africa, <laughs> or, uh, yes, and, 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 and by homophobes on the continent who might say, oh, yes, Binya Vanga, um, of course he's writing it in a Western publication because that's a Western thing that they're trying to impose on us. And he said, I deliberately wanted to avoid that and I wanted to put it on a site run by Africans, owned by Africans, because I felt if I did that, then I would sort of change the conversation and we would own that conversation. I mean, that's a brilliant move. And I, and I remember at the time, he then pops up, not on a Western media outlet, and you could Google this if you want. I remember I followed this, because I, I remember writing about this yeah, at the yeah. time. He popped up on Kenyan TV. Yeah. I think it was, it was like Larry Madabo's show or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people know who They're Larry They're sitting Madabo. on a bench there together. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> which is another show on Kenyan TV, which we just saw. Which is that guy, yes, another, um, uh, Koinange, Jeff Koinange on the mm. bench. On the bench with Jeff. <laughs> well, we don't want to mention that one right now. But yeah, and he pops up on this bench and they're having this like really frank conversation about, about homophobia, about coming out, that I thought was incredible. 
And like for that, th this, so when we talk about like what is the major impacts of being a Lango and above everything else, most other things, I think it is these, these sort of two signposts. Is like one, what he had done to sort of just like throw, I might say throw a bomb, <laughs> and like the conversation about how we talk about Africa. You can say. And then we, and you know, we have, we have, we have some other arguments about like we felt like so once you once you say they're stereotyped, well, what what else is then? Then you've got to ask like what else is there? And then there's a different kinds of opinions about the complexity of Africa. There's no one opinion, and we have our Africa's country has its own kind of, you know, take and mm -hmm. its own sort of set of interpretations of articles that it wants to write. Um, but the second thing is really I think what he has done at a popular level. I mean, he wasn't writing a movement. But as a as a as a very well known and prominent African um, a gay person, what he had done for the visibility of gay people, uh, for just for like you know the sort of things that people often take for granted around around kind of I don't know how to put it like you know heteronormativity homophobia mm -hmm. and he just he just uh, he talks about it somewhere else about like how for many years he didn't feel ready. He didn't feel he had the words. That's part of the why he did. I'm a homosexual mom. Yeah. Was and he felt he felt that like okay, I have the power and I can say something. And I think that's those are the things he he done. He did many other things, but I think those are probably the things that people um, uh, remember him for most. Yeah. And I would add that it was it was also about building the infrastructure yeah. for creative production on the continent, and this is why he started Kwani. In Kenya, this is why he wanted to publish yes, yes. on African publications. Yeah. This is why later, although one of his early successes was winning the Kane Prize, he later distanced himself from the Kane Prize and was was much more interested in African literary prizes um, and publishing stories, not always uh, about yeah. migration, which is okay, but but encouraging local production, local publishing stories about local culture uh, and, and if it's about migration it's about moving in the continent moving around there's a great project which i know people can't find online anymore the chimurenga did um i think it may have been called migrations but it's just people a bunch of african writers like moving around writing about i think adichie was part of it he was part of it and a few other people just kind of writing about visiting places it's like beautiful essay you know it's about He's like pretending to write about football in Ghana, mm -hmm. but yeah, I think he actually ends up writing about Togo. There's, you know, just like the travel writing that he did about South Africa, sure, yeah. the columns that he had in the Mail and Guardian in South Africa. Like he just, like you're right, like writing in African publications, like just just on his own, trying to 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 change the way that Africans talk about themselves. Because here's one other thing that people, once you make the critique, for example, that like, oh, this is how they write about us. What people forget is also, it's not like Nigerian journalists were writing about South Africa. Not as much. Or, no. Yeah, like, or, or Nigerian television is, is having co a correspondent in South Africa. <laughs> Maybe now they might, channels, TV might have Some a part. Some time has passed. In TV, but right. If they but can like, afford it. Exactly, <laughs> but that, that's, that, that might be more recent. That, that, those kind of discussions are very rarely um, took place, and I think he should be commended also for doing that. And this is a good way for us to segue into the second one, which is he was, he represented also, he was also part of like a moment, um, which seems ancient now, and people might not understand its full value now, but like the, the that whole kind of emergence of sort of a code of writers like him, they didn't all write novels, they were sometimes put together in the public sphere. I would say him, Teju Cole, Helen Habila, Chimamanda Adichie, all people with various kinds of politics, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, kind That's of left sure. liberal, libertarian, I don't know, pan-Africanist, middle class, <laughs> neoliberal, but they were all sort of like, 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 mostly middle class, I would say, like very yeah. middle class in their orientation, but they all kind of emerged in particular, very forceful, and they, and they had to be reckoned with, and they began, they beginning to publish like popular literature, they were writing in a popular style that was accessible, this was not like, you know, what your grandfather's literature. This was like stuff that was popular. And I think now that there's so much more African writing and people are publishing novels and other, people don't realize that something like, some, something like that had to happen. Somebody had to break, the, open the door. Tell the people, I think Boniface Mwangi, the Kenyan photographer, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
he did an Instagram post this week where he said there's something like in Kenya, for example, it's like before Binyavanga and after Binyavanga when you think of like creativity um, and you know, like yeah, yeah. It, I think it, it was also part of of liberating a younger generation of, of African writers right. to say you don't have to write about colonization and exclusively anymore. You can actually write about about sex and about relationships, correct, uh, yeah. and and anything you want in in your your life, and not have to only refer back to the historical periods of and once again Chimurenga of oppression. Places like Chimurenga should get credit for a lot of this. They probably like the first Vinyavanga pieces, like the first big sort of literary type writing that he did. I think Discovering Home that one in the Kane Prize comes out of there. A lot of Chimamanda's early writings was in, Chim was in Chimorenga. Similarly, this is a small footnote, I remember reading uh, a little essay by a writer who called himself Teju Cole, like that I was reading stuff to me, like when you're, like, you're, you're, you're a reader, you're like helping them. Mm, yeah. You know, we probably this or not. Yeah. And I remember reading this little essay, this, well, this little vignette about this guy who's in this cafe in Brussels, talking to these like Moroccan internet cafe dudes. That became a big part of that novel. What was it called um, by, by Cole? His first novel? Every Day is for the Thief. No, no, the, 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 well, oh, that's, his first, that's his technically Open his first City. novel. Open City, which is his really second novel, but in the US yeah. would be considered his first novel. But like, that's where I first saw that writing. You know, so like, there's an interesting, there's a thing that I think as we move along, people assume this was always there, but there's, there's Binyavanga, I think, can, should, should be understood in that way, that he was part of this, like, very much literary, it was a literary stuff. I mean, he wasn't like, Binyavanga was never, um, he's not like a social movement guy. I know he started his own movement at one point, right? Well, I, it was just a little bit of, of talk, I think. Yeah. The Upright People's Movement. Something right. like that. It was it was a few YouTube. But videos he was more like a literary. Guy. But it, but it was yeah. always just yeah. talking. It was not not just talk, but it was always about using yeah. the form of of, of speech to. <laughs> and to this is this and, and again, we're not trying to. I'm, I'm not. We're not minimizing. No. We're not. What, what I'm saying is like the the, the 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 impact of this guy on literary culture, particularly African literature, literary culture in the 21st century, cannot be underestimated. Pop, at a sort of popular level, I think people are like, like, why are people talking about this guy so much? And particular, particularly in this age of the internet. I mean, I think by now with social media and like little short, you know, of course his health also deteriorated, but like, you know, the, the, this age of the like the Snapchat and the Instagram and whatever kind of changed the power of that group. Yeah. When they were shaping like popular culture, but. It, we cannot underestimate just how important those sure. people were. And yeah. an even newer yeah. generation is, yeah. is emerging now to right. take their place. But he was part of this, this time where after, after being elevated into a position of, of being a tastemaker, yeah. he does Africa 39. So he's selecting, he's, being, he's a part of a process where he's selecting young right. writers who are under the age of 39 to be, be part of a newer generation at that time. Uh, which includes many, many voices that are popular and, and almost mm -hmm. mainstream now. Uh, he became a gatekeeper in the sense that he had relationships with, with publishers. Right. Uh, and so because they said, hey, this, this guy is an important figure, we trust him, um, he would recommend people to the publishers whose work ended up you know, really getting out there. I, I mean, saw he, yeah. Kweke Amezi, for example, is yeah. somebody who was crediting him uh, for, oh, okay, for making oh, a connection to oh. the publisher. Uh, for their first novel. So. I mean, in his own case, he was frustrated that he that he he. By, I think when he was when he was when he passed away, um, he was working. I think on on like two novels. He right? talked about he at talked least about three, work, at least three yeah, books, yeah. one or two novels, and a couple of yeah. nonfiction pieces. And in that sort of in that whole cultural in that sphere, people are waiting for your novel. Like, where's the novel? Where's the novel? And he had written a memoir. He had written like short essays. He had little, little creative pieces. But they, and I think, you know, like, in the way that writing works, there were people like, where's the novel, yeah, where's the that, novel? That's and, the highest form. Right, but here, but you pointed out something interesting, I think he also acted in a way like, a, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say he was a gatekeeper, I think he was more like, a, like an impresario of sorts, connecting people, 
Um, you know, like the, I think the work of Kwani, I mean, there's Kalika Hora and others, they were like doing the day to day. But there's, a, there's you know, that kind of role that Binyavanga um, played. Do we want to say quickly something? Because I know we, we were sort of running with time. Um, other writings that we like by Binyavanga, well, there's a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. I, mean, he's, I, want to, I want to single out something, but you speak about one first. Yeah, he had, yeah. He had a lot of his earlier pieces. Yeah. Definitely, again, go to Planet Binya to check, it, to check out the journey. Mm -hmm. You know that that he was on that got him to, to where he was at. But one of my favorite pieces um, is called "Since Everything Was Sudden Suddening Into a Hurricane," which he also published in Granta. And this is after he has uh, a major stroke, which you know from that point a couple of years ago his health really had had declined. Um, and in terms of voice, in terms of uh, incredible writing talent, raw. Right raw writing talent. I, I love this piece um, because it's, it's so deeply personal about his life and also he manages in a really beautiful way uh, to capture the, the, the physical struggles he was having with his own body you know, after experiencing the stroke. Um, if, you, if you see clips of him or if you, were, if you saw him in person after the stroke, he, he had trouble speaking, right. um, he wasn't able to to, you, to move in the same way that he could before, uh, and so he was almost you know, a prisoner inside his body to some extent, and he captures that within, within this piece through the kind of broken style of the writing, a lot of commas, uh, punctuation that isn't right. always formal. He, he definitely was breaking conventions, um, and then a really fragmented thought process. Uh, and, and yet at the same time telling deeply personal stories about love and family and, and loss and, and I think it's, it's incredible. It's funny, I think we're both, is it, this is since yeah, everything was suddenly into, mm -hmm. uh, it's funny we both like this piece a lot. But it, even for different ways. For different ways. ways. I liked it for like, just, and I was, before we came on air, we, I sort of, I started reading at the end of it. But I really, I mean, I'll, I'll say the title again so people can get it. Since everything was suddenly into a hurricane, it's in Granta, right? And it, it opens with like a Thomas Sankara quote, which I told you, you know, the one about it took the madmen of yesterday for us to be able to act with extreme clarity today. I want to be one of those madmen who must dare to invent the future. And it points for me to like, Binyavanga was, despite what I said earlier about sort of his literary, kind of that was his primary thing about literary culture, the, like writing. I've seen interviews where he talks about how he writes, when he interviews people, how he likes to interview them. Um, but he was also a political person. Um, his politics, you know, it, it would, I mean, I'm just, just riffing on yeah, that, sure, just yeah. a quote. His politics, I think some, you know, it, it, it wasn't, there wasn't like, there, there wasn't like with some of us where like, we have like a straight line, <laughs> we belong to a particular kind of political tendency. Yeah. He's really jumped around and he would quote, you know, uh, Sankara and other times, if he says like, what is our future? He would actually kind of describe a libertarian one. Um, uh, and other times he's, he's, he's promoting maybe markets. Like I'm just saying like, at other times he's singing the praises of, of Kenya's public education system, public health system. He's like, I'm the product of, of now, whatever <laughs> hospital, this public high school. I mean, that, so, so there's like, somebody who, who, who at times, you know, could be deemed a left, deemed left wing, at other times libertarian, at other times, a liberal, like he's just like doing, and other times he's an incredible, he's, he's, he's Pan-African, the way, particularly the way he writes about South Africa, I think is incredible, he, people don't know, but he went to South Africa in the mid 90s to study at the University of Transkei, which is unusual, like if you go from, if you go, to, if you're from the rest of Africa, you go to study at Rhodes in South Africa, or UCT, or, or Vets, Vets, yeah. old white, the former white mm -hmm. liberal universities, um, don't Google me, I went to one of those too, sometimes. <laughs> But, oh, I did actually, I graduated from there. Mm -hmm. But like in his case, he went to a historically black university, one that was created by apartheid. I mean, you know, not to get too much into the complexity of South Africa, but like a former homeland university. And he talks about how that was one of the most formative experiences of, you know, of his life. Like that's when, that's when he realized he's a Pan-African, mm -hmm. that he's an African. That, so there's, there's some, there's, you know, just if you think about that, the other part that I like in this essay is um, the way he writes about, in this particular essay, so it's, it's, as you said earlier, it's like he's writing about health, he's just had a stroke, he's going back, he's going to hang out with his dad, 
you so, soon realize that that is sick. But there's this other part in it, and I've got two more things I want to say. The one is he talks about how he's just describing Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And it did, like everywhere in Africa, is, it is oil and copper and gas oozing everywhere, and highways tearing through trees and railways and ports, and Nairobi's eastern mold that have fallen from the sky to land all over. There are cars jam-packed and full of women who are born-again Pentecostals, and single mothers who pass the exam for banking better than men. <laughs> apartments, apartments, and new apartment block blocks. The city's garbage dump doubling in size every year, imported wine and good cheese in every, where am I now, in every new mall all over the city. An epidemic of breast cancer, our soldiers in Somalia and the forgotten people of forgotten places of Kenya attacking police and their neighbors. To kill is to insist, is to matter or else. But then it just from there, it goes in, there's also like a little subtext about him bringing his boyfriend at the time, I don't know if it's that the, the person he was eventually gonna marry, to, to his dad, but he's saying, I'm bringing my friend. And then he has that moment where he says, um, there's this like, weird thing where he's like, he, he's weird around his dad. He's just talking about other bullshit or whatever to not talk about, like, I don't know, he doesn't want to make a connection with his dad. Yeah. And then he realizes that his dad had made a bed for him and his, his boyfriend in his old bedroom and he's flabbergasted. But I'm just like that, you know, the, those those parts, and then it ends with this really sort of harrowing account of his father's passing. And you said you you've talked about how there's something about his writing after he had his stroke that you could see. In some, I, I don't know if this was written before. It or was after. after. I mean, yeah. It has so a you see it has a brain kind of scan. Yeah. <laughs> right. The, the header image is a brain scan. Ah, of, there you go. Of, yeah. Of, I think his own brain. Yeah. And so I think it mimics. Right, the way right. his, his thinking was, you know, at the time, with this meandering, fragmented style, but it ultimately has a point and it gets there. And I think that's what <laughs> a lot of the interactions with him are also like, even before, that it, there's a meandering, but it, but it gets there and it reveals a kind of cultural politics, which is about stepping outside of status quo mainstream right, yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually was listening to a podcast on, on Gramsci you know, Antonio oh. Gramsci's in uh, Germany yesterday. So, okay, some neo Marxism. Good. Okay, okay. I'm and, and, and I, and I, I was like making a connection. So my so that we, we might we might move to the to our, our true Marxist roots <laughs> in future. I like this. Because and I and I was really th I was making a yeah. connection mm -hmm. about how he was really fighting this battle of, mm -hmm. of cultural politics, trying to get people to to step outside of you know road education styles of of learning of of you know. Capitalism being being a norm and being able to to think about creating new media How to in different it, forms, yeah, yeah. yeah, outside of major corporations, outside of major cities in the world, you know that are considered traditional centers of power. Do it yourself in your own voice. That was really what he was standing for. Especially, you, wrote, you also Russia. wrote about China. I mean, there's another bunch of essays that I would recommend. The Guardian. If you just go to the Guardian, the British Guardian. You, you type in his name, you'll see a bunch of things he wrote for them. Um, and you he write, he's written about like Africa and its relationship to China. He's way more pragmatic and like, you know, that like, he's like, they want something, we want something. Like, he's like very good at like those kind of, in de in debating those kind of things. But the one last thing I want to mention, because again, we have to move on to our last two things we have to say about Kinyanga, <laughs> is that he also wrote about Kenyan politics. Mm -hmm. I think people forget that he, in 2013, I think he had written about how he accepted the result and he, he wanted to accept the result because, you know, it was a, an election. Um, there's a lot of manipulation of, like, uh, there's electoral violence, there's deliberately. This is not, this is not, oh, violence is endemic to Kenyan politics. No, this is it's deliberate. It's done deliberate to get an advantage in election. So, you know, it's, a, it's not like Kenyans are violent. It's just like, that's how you, that's how these tactics elite gets ahead, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you remember also using, uh, basically, I think before Trump, they had, or was it right after Trump that Cambridge Analytica went there and tried to manipulate the election? Yeah, yeah in Kenya. I mean, so there's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's very sophisticated manipulation of elections. But anyway, in that election, he said, okay, I'm, I, I want to accept this result. I'm not happy with it, but for the sake of peace, let's have this election. And then at the next election, I was looking for that essay yesterday, but I couldn't find it. Well, he actually writes another essay and says, you know, I'm not so sure whether that was the right thing to do. That thing where we said, for the sake of unity, 
let's let's make uh, Uhuru Kenyatta president. Now I'm not so sure about that. So it's like he grappled with with Kenyan elections. He he he. I saw an image of him at the court hearing. Um, for the decriminalization of homosexuality in mm. Kenya, you know, he was he didn't he didn't stand aside. He was very much involved in politics, and he was an always. There were times that he had made you can you can you can Google on Twitter if you want. Um, but there's there's also where people disagreed with him, where they felt he took he didn't take the right kind of position on on, on certain abuses, etc. So like you know those Binimango wasn't perfect. But he was a political. He was a political. He, he, he was involved in politics. He didn't set aside and not do anything. Now we wanted to, we wanted to talk about um, uh, one last thing. Actually, yeah, we want to get to the one last one, mm -hmm. which is um, you read. You read like some of the some of the things we sort of flag for people, like some of the stuff that's been written about him um, since his passing. Of course, there's been a lot of, you know, I can't say ink spill, but on the internet, there's a ton of stuff already. <laughs> Some obituaries, etc., appreciations, um, and you, you've, you've, you, I, I looked at some of them, and it sounds like you had a better yeah. sense of the general kind of overview of what there is. I mean, I think in in the media game, people rush to to get out mm -hmm. the the basic summary right. kind of obituary, which is which is attempting to honor somebody's life, but is which never really does things justice to to push it out so fast. So there, you know, the mainstream publications actually, he was getting, it shows how big of a figure he was. He was getting attention from, um, the Times I would be from, from New mm -hmm. York Times, from mm -hmm. all kinds of major publications around the world, from Public Radio International, um, and the, these quick first pieces just, you know, talk mostly how to write about Africa. This is, this yeah. is his major, you know, about, accomplishment yeah. in life. And you know there wasn't so much you know other texture uh, to that. So we have some other pieces coming. We've tried to give it more more justice, more attention. Pieces. There's a good piece on New Frame, which is this publication out of Johannesburg. Um, Percy's Ramoya, who's a Zimbabwean writer. Um, he's got a nice piece about a very personal piece about kind of his encounters with Binyavanga um, and kind of assessing his life. I, I haven't read it yet. But I know that Pali Kahora would work with him at um, Kwani. He's written a piece, right? He has a piece In, up on Lit Hub. It just right. it was just, just, published, just, so just put out. So we out. expect that there'll be. I mean, we've got we've got some pieces. We got one by the the writer uh, uh, Maya um, Wegelov. Is that how you say name? And she's also an, as a performer. Soma Josi in South Africa. Um, Sirubiri Moses is doing a piece. Um, I'm trying to coach myself into writing something hopefully mm -hmm. by the weekend um, because I think I think in the next week there'll be much more reflective stuff coming I think mostly by hopefully more more from Africans by people or people who are people familiar who people who knew and people who are personal presumed. stories right that, that, that that's come out nevertheless there's also a video we'll, 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 we'll end with this before we'll, we'll mm -hmm. say a little bit about some of the stuff you can read on our website this week but um, there's been also some bad. There's also been like some terrible stuff, and I, I did, I did see that there was, um, there was. Uh, not everybody was happy that Binyavanga was 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 a very out man, um, and that he was, and, you know, he had also declared. Uh, well, he was firstly that he was gay, but secondly that he was that he was very open about his HIV um, positive status, um, and so you know the usual bigotry had to be online. There was there was just random idiots like saying random stuff. But the one that was really kind of that stood out was shocking was this uh, character called Reno or Mokri or Mokri. Mm -hmm. He's probably gonna sue us for this. But this is in the public sphere so I don't know how. Uh, who had been I think a spokesperson a while back for the president of the former president of Nigeria when when Good Luck Jonathan was in power, uh, this is before Buhari, um or Mokri or Mokri is that his name? Yeah, Om Omokri. Omokri was his spokesperson, and subsequent to that, he left the Nigeria, went to live in the U.S., where in the state of California, I think, where I think gay marriage is legal, where yeah. they have full rights, <laughs> and he um, he like has a Twitter account where he does all kinds of with quite a large following, with quite a large following, Something like seven hundred thousand followers. And he like he like his mimeograph search about about 
you go buy shirts he, where he's like he's kind of a marketing guru he, he, he thinks something. of himself as somebody who gives life advice he's a he's a kind of entrepreneurial business pastor right uh, he's a, a charismatic <laughs> church but he tweeted something um do we want to do we want to read this this uh, bigotry or do you just want to like summarize i, I actually don't want to read it don't want to read it but no. it's basically trying to take advantage of of the passing of, of binyavanga uh, and calling it a teachable moment about being about being gay and about being HIV positive, and trying to suggest that this is you know a lesson for people. But like being gay leads to HIV, and so like, these are choices that, yeah. that you make. Yeah, if you're gay, you're going to be HIV positive, which is to the to to. There were some people who then agreed with him, like like randoms, people on Twitter in particular. Apparently, would like. Uh, um, you know, like, yeah, you're right, what you're saying. But then there were, uh, again, I don't want to, um, yeah, just the usual, like, like, homophobic bullshit, right? But there were people who kind of said, actually, hold on, the majority of the of people who are the victims of, of, of who are HIV positive or living with, with AIDS are women in Africa, and they're heterosexual. <laughs> I mean, I'm not making light of it, but, like, you know, they were just like, I mean, I'm sort of, because of the ridiculousness of it, people were just sort of like, you could see their reaction, it was like, huh? You know, those things aren't linked, I don't know where you get this from. Um, and, but then there was also a bunch of people, people we know, and I, I, we're going to keep that one, but the, to end with that one, but there's a couple of people I want to sort of read, like a few, one of them is like, um, uh, there's this one by, um, let me see this one here. But Bill, well, we don't actually don't know her. Galdina, Omar, this is on Facebook. Yeah. Wrote, this is an absolutely unacceptable comment. You know, no, Omar Pri, you forget that heterosexuals have also been dying of AIDS in in large numbers. Should also abstain all their lives. I mean, you know. So this is like this person is probably also slightly conservative. So they're like, we must abstain. But so <laughs> well, heterosexuals must also abstain. Respect is called for at all times. Respect yourself so you can respect others. Why Nana achieved significant milestones such as his literary work and standing up for what he believed in, for which he was globally recognized. Let his fans celebrate his life in peace without your petty, disrespectful whining. And then just one other quick one, which is Anna Jager, who is who's like a curator in Berlin, does a lot of curating of African art. She wrote Beyond the Hate, Homophobia and ignorance is this and sadly many other posts since yesterday. What is most gut wrenching is the samelessness of abusing someone's death, what you what you sort of said, to push a completely unrelated agenda. He didn't die of anything remotely connected to age or his sexuality. To be completely clear, if he did, it wouldn't allow for such cruel comments anyway. I shudder at the coldness of heart. But the best I, I the last word on, on, on this sort of this this terrible bigotry uh, goes to somebody so, who we who we um, who we have used to describe. You know? So there's a, a I, I would call him I would call him a, a friend. Uh, a he's gonna see this on Twitter, so we just want to say <laughs> okay, so say uh, his name and then I want to just say we love you. Pai Ki Day. Pai Ki Day, we love you. The, we disagree sometimes. But we love you. The internet's father of African literary critique. <laughs> I love this part. He's going to trademark this and put this under his thing. But hey, okay. Um, he says... He said it best. He says, uh, responding directly to, to Reno. Reno. Uh, Ren, 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 Reno Mokri. Reno, Reno Mokri. You are despicable. And for this, I am blocking you. That's so... I, I just want to say, if you're on the internet, that's why you keep it. <laughs> Bye, Kide, we love you. <laughs> uh, I want my Kide to see this later. We're going to tag him. Um, in any case, I think that would that just sum that up that people really, you know, people people love Binyavanga. He was an incredible, I think it, it, it's, he was an incredible human being. Yeah. And his significance can't be underestimated. No. So please check out the archive of his work. Enjoy the work. If you are just encountering him, that's the best way to celebrate his life. Yeah. He had, he had faded from the public eye for the last couple of years um, because of his, his health for the there. most part. So, so revisit his archive, Planet Binya, um, read these pieces that we're recommending, and that's part of the celebration. And be inspired by you know, what his words were, which is really have your own imagination and have your own voice 
uh, in the creative work that you do? I think the, the only thing to say at the end is just Binyaranga, rest in peace. So with that, we'll sign up for this week. All right. Excellent. First round. <laughs> First round. Binyaranga, we love you. All right. Anyway, have a nice day, people. Peace.